All right, Claire Crawford talking Ohio State football with us every week. Uh, join her on the Ozone.net and her podcast, Oh Hail No. We've got the Buckeyes and the Hawkeyes uh, in Iowa City. And I think there's probably, Claire, a faction of Ohio State fans that are, deep in, are, are breathing a deep sigh of relief after this outcome, and rightfully so, but also projecting that, okay, we beat the best team in the conference other than us, so we've got it. There are three difficult games left, and this is a road test that all you have to do is rewind a few weeks to Penn State going to Iowa, and you get a feel for what's possible in Iowa City against a good opponent. I completely agree. That was a, a very narrow victory by Penn State, and obviously what we saw what happened with Ohio State and Penn State. Um, and Iowa is a team that grinds for all four quarters, and it sounds very cliche, but they will have to play a very complete game from top to bottom all four quarters, and it's going to require them to tighten up. This is an environment that is not friendly. Um, they have not announced a kickoff time yet, and um, if, <laughs> if we know anything about so far this year, it's most likely going to be after the sun sets. It does make a difference, and um, it's an environment where that it can certainly swing things towards the home team. On paper, uh, the Buckeyes are a more talented team, but when you make mistakes like turning over the football and when you make mistakes on special teams and you're on the road, those things are very difficult to overcome. You know, you hear terms like trap game when it comes to games like this. You get guys looking ahead. Um, however... I was thinking about this earlier today. I would say the only reason the Buckeyes mentally would not be preparing themselves for, you know, a trap game is because if there was ever a humbling win or if there was ever a win that just knit a team together and and and, and completely reminded them of the brotherhood and what they can survive together, it was that win against Penn State. And I think it's more of them being able to ride the momentum of that and the momentum of what they know they can get through and having the confidence now knowing they can get through something like that. Um, I believe that um, it should make a difference in Iowa city. I was five and three right now. They're two and three in the big 10. They're not a great football team. They're probably one of the 30 or 35 best teams in the country, something in that range, but they beat Iowa state who is now vying for a big 12 championship after defeating Oklahoma state or Oklahoma and at TCU, and uh, I watched every play of the Penn State game at Iowa, and it was cla classic Hawkeyes football. Defensively, their defensive line was dominant in that game, uh, very much Ohio State-esque in its uh, play against the Penn State defensive line or offensive line. They, they must have batted like seven or eight passes back into uh, Trace McSorley's face. They were all over the place. They were extremely impressive. The defensive front seven is really good. Uh, Josie Jewell is one of the best linebackers in the country. Uh, Anthony, Anthony Nelson, you'll see him uh, this week at defensive end. He has eight sacks and six tackles for loss. Uh, he's an exceptional player as well. So, yes, the, the talent is not extremely close between these two teams, but in the right atmosphere, playing the right game plan and executing it, that's what evens out these kind of matchups. And uh, it took Penn State to the last play of the game to beat this team, even though they gained a ton of yardage and they had a perfect uh, remedy for Saquon Barkley. They allowed him to gain a ton of yardage, but they boxed him in, didn't allow him to, to, to get loose for big plays, and they kept it between the 20s. And they just really gutted it out in the red zone and did not let Penn State score touchdowns to get away from them. Uh, yeah, I was going to be difficult to... Uh, Urban Meyer just has to point to the game Penn State played at Iowa and say, this is what this team is capable of doing, so don't look at their record or that they only beat Minnesota by a touchdown because that's just who they are. <laughs> They're not going to beat the worst team in the country by more than 15 or 20 points. That's just how they play football. And nor should I think Urban Meyer should point to say, hey, this is how you beat Iowa to the Penn State game. I, I, I don't think that's the recipe on how to beat Iowa. You mentioned Josie Jewell. Um, they also have a very talented defensive back that's going to be – he's on the Bednark uh, uh, watch list. Um, this is a team that is hungry for a signature win. 
and it would be awfully convenient to do so at home in a big, big environment against the number three team in the nation, three slash four team. <laughs> As of right now, <laughs> three slash four team in the nation. And it, it would be a, a feather in Kirk Ferentz's hat. I know that Urban Myers never brought a team uh, to Iowa. He, he was there as a, a grad assistant and was there as a, a coach before and has played against Iowa with Florida, but he's never uh, been a Buckeye in that environment before. So it'll be interesting uh, to see how the Buckeyes go in and handle that. All right, folks, just a rundown of Iowa's personnel real quick. If you have yet to see the Hawkeyes this year, you're going to see a freshman quarterback in Nathan Stanley. He makes mistakes, uh, not necessarily throwing interceptions. He's got 17 touchdowns and four picks, and Iowa's played, as I mentioned, some pretty good teams in Penn State and Iowa State in particular. Uh, he's hitting on 58% of his passes. He's got a little mobility, but he's not going to burn a defense. What's interesting to me is Akram Wadley's one of the best backs in the Big Ten. He's slippery. He's really good out of the backfield. He is only averaging four yards per carry, four flat. You know, in the college game, that's not a whole lot. They've got a second back in James Butler, who was a transfer from Nevada. He's averaging four yards per carry. So I got to think that there are issues along the Iowa offensive line, which is typically a stellar unit. That's Kirk Ferentz. Uh, specialty is crafting offensive lines and they must be having some issues there because Akram Wadley is a guy that averages more like six yards a carry typically, but he's struggling this season out of the backfield. They are not going to have any wide receivers that are going to scare Ohio State's defensive backs downfield. Noah Fant is an exceptional tight end and leads them in receiving. And again, the defensive personnel is not outstanding from the standpoint of grasping uh, five stars uh, coming out of high school, but uh, they develop them well and they put them in situations to succeed. And many of them move on to the NFL uh, along that front seven, especially on defense. As you mentioned, I believe you're talking about uh, Amani Hooker. So let's, well, we won't, won't uh, get our hookers confused. Uh, I don't know where that <laughs> statement belongs between Malik last year with the Buckeyes and Amani sure. uh, for Iowa this year, but he is one of the better backs in the nation. And, uh, Again, they, they have some some pieces to put together an effort if they play the A game versus the Ohio State C game that could make it extremely difficult. Like you mentioned, they've got this pro-style offense. Um, it's going to be something that the Buckeyes haven't truly faced, if you think about it. Looking back on some of the offenses uh, that the Buckeyes have faced, it's not like something they've faced, but it's not something that they're unfamiliar with as far as how to game plan for. Um, and... Uh, that tight end that you mentioned, he is one of uh, the, the go-to targets. Uh, the Buckeyes have faced some really talented tight ends this year. Mike Kosicki did the most damage on the Buckeyes, arguably, um, last week. So it's going to be another situation. Um, Jordan Fuller is somebody, again, versus Penn State, that they picked on all day long and he ended up leading the team in tackles so this these defensive secondary for the Buckeyes has been tested uh, but they are becoming just uh they're becoming forged in the steel of these tests it's it's um in the fires of these tests they've, they've they're really stepping up so I'm excited to see some of those mismatches uh be proven wrong Ohio State on the road for its stiffest road test of the season this Saturday at Iowa City to take on the black cladded from top to bottom Hawkeyes wearing the alternate uh, uniforms. And I'm sure they'll have some semblance of a black out there in Iowa City with the Hawkeyes taking on the Buckeyes should be an intriguing matchup. And again, talent is not close on these two teams, but the Hawkeyes are very capable under the right circumstances of making this an intriguing game. And I would not be shocked if they do just that. Uh, Claire Crawford joining us from the ozone.net and her podcast with Joe Dexter. Oh, hail no to talk up the Buckeyes and the Hawkeyes. And uh, Claire, we always appreciate the uh, discussion. Thank you so much for having me on. It's my favorite topic.